Thank you for registering for uh, today's presentation. I'm Bob Toyofuku from the Pacific Law Institute. And uh, before I introduce the speakers, uh, let me mention some preliminary matters. Uh, first of all, what are we gonna cover this morning? We'll discuss whether the Capitol will be closed or, and maybe eventually open. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit about the schedule and uh, a lot of time will be spent on hearings and testimony. And uh, the finance chair and the Ways and Means vice chair will discuss the budget and fiscal issues. And we will also talk about uh, the conference committee uh, process. If you have any questions, please uh, check the uh, Q&A box and you can write your questions in there and we'll do our best to um, uh, answer as many of them as possible during the presentation. For those of you who need closed captions, you can press the CC button uh, on the bottom of your screen and uh, check, uh, click request, and then you should be able to uh, get closed captions. Um, Here's some uh, basic information uh, before we I introduce the speakers. Uh, make sure that you're aware of the legislative website, uh, which is capital.hawaii.gov. Uh, there's a general information and frequently asked questions on the website. And also the... Um, Public Access Room has created a guide, and uh, that will be very helpful for anybody who uh, um, wants to get more information. And don't forget the, the state's state ethics uh, website uh, for reporting requirements that you are responsible for if you are going to do any lobbying at the state legislature. So. Let me take a, a, by the way, before I start, the session obviously is going to open on January 19 and will close on March 5. So it's a more or less a normal 60-day session with the recesses that are included. Um, so let me introduce the uh, speakers for this morning's presentation. And I'd like to thank them up front for uh, being available and spending the time to uh, give you an idea of how the 2022 session will be uh, conducted. First of all, we have Senator Ronald Kochi, who is the uh, Senate President, Representative Scott Psyche, who is the Speaker of the House, Senator Drew Mamu Kanuha, who is the Senate Majority Leader. Representative Della Al Baladi, who is the House Majority Leader, Senator Gilbert Keith Agaron, who is Vice Chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate, and lastly, Representative Sylvia Luke, who is the Chair of the House Finance Committee. So I really appreciate the time that they're spending uh, to make this presentation and uh, the preliminary meetings that we've had. So let me turn it over now to Senate President Ronald Kochi and House Speaker uh, Scott Psyche to make a few comments and advise you as to uh, whether the Capitol is going to be open or stay closed for initially. Senate President and uh, Speaker. So thank you, Bob. Uh, you immediately had somebody firing away in the chat. I guess you said session would run from January 19th to March 5th, and uh, the correction in the box is accurate. It would be May 5th or Cinco de Mayo is when we would anticipate oh, sorry, ending, ending session. But you know that shows that everybody's alert. And I must say, this is amazing. I'm, I'm looking at 555 participants. This is the largest meeting I've participated in. And so I really uh, appreciate and thank you for your interest. My part to talk about the opening of the Capitol will be brief. The Capitol won't be open. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Next. No, actually, the speaker and I, uh, you know, have been meeting and we've been engaged with both of our caucuses. And we were looking forward to having the Capitol open on uh, March 9th, I mean, January 19th. We had looked at some limited family perhaps attending because we couldn't have a traditional opening and having the gallery open uh, based upon the gathering limits that the city or the mayor had in place. As the numbers continue to rise, we met regularly and we finally uh, made a determination and issued a statement on Wednesday morning that uh, we're going to continue with the Capitol being closed on January 19th. We would be continuing to monitor uh, the numbers as far as positives and more importantly, hospitalizations and uh, you know, we do anticipate at some point the Capitol will be reopened. And uh, if it is reopened, it would follow the process of any other state facility that's currently open. You'd need a proof of vaccination or a negative test to enter. Uh, we realize we'd have people walking in. So we have been discussing having a checkpoint so you could enter from the rotunda area and a second checkpoint at the glass doors where we would be able to verify the information. So initially we're going to operate as we had operated last session uh, and we would have the remote participation available. When we reopen, I hope we can have a hybrid system. Uh, we have been talking for years about trying to have that as an availability initially because of the cost and impact on neighbor island residents who wanted to testify, but I realize now it might be easier to get from Lehui to the capital and back to Lehui than to drive from Nanakuli or Waianae and get into the capital and get back home. As well as the fact that we have uh, people with underlying medical conditions and those by virtue of their experience position in life who may not feel comfortable being in the hearing room and so, you know, we'll, we'll work towards seeing when we reopen, when we do reopen, then we'll articulate a clear set of policies and procedures about how we're going to operate. And I'd simply close uh, with one of the things Bob had on the list for speaker and I to discuss, would there be time limits? Yes, there will be time limits, whether we're opened or not. We only have so many conference rooms and 16 committees. And so a committee, you know, the first committee needs to end on time so that the second committee can convene and we're able to transact all of the people's business. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the speaker. Thank you, Bob, and to all of the participants. Thank you, Senator President. Hey, thanks, Bob. Thanks for organizing this event. Um, it's just, we're, ha we're happy to see the turnout. Um, um, and I think it reflects, you know, every, the, the public's interest in what will happen um, in this upcoming session. Um, so I wanted to, you know, before I start, um, I wanted to just emphasize that, you know, the Senate, President Kochi and I, um, we waited to the very last minute to, to decide whether or not the building would be open. And that's because we did not want to close the building. Uh, we, want, we wanted the building to be open. We wanted the public to have an opportunity to be here in the building uh, during the session. It was only because the numbers, as you know, exponentially increased um, that we had to make the diff very difficult decision to, to close the building. Uh, but as the president mentioned, we will be reviewing, you know, uh, we will be assessing the numbers, the COVID numbers as we go forward. And we will revisit this, um, this, this decision to close the building uh, when the numbers improve. So I wanted to just uh, go over a couple of areas. One is, um, on the committee hearings and the procedure. And you know, some of what I'm gonna be saying really applies more to the House because the Senate does have its own procedures as well for how committee hearings will be conducted. Um, testimony will be received in writing and or verbally via Zoom. The House hearing notices will provide instructions to submit testimony. Uh, the notices and instructions are also on our website, as Bob mentioned, it's capital.hawaii. Dot gov for the house hearing notices will be posted 48 hours prior to the hearing except that monday and tuesday hearings 
will be noticed on the preceding Friday by 4.30 p.m. So you should be checking the website uh, for notices. You can also subscribe to uh, hearing notices. And again, the instructions and the deadlines to submit written testimony is will be on the hearing notice, the hearing notices. If you have difficulty accessing the hearings, you can call the committee's, uh, the committee clerk's office or the committee vice chair, vice chair's office. And that information will be, be provided on the hearing notices. The vice chairs of our committees will be responsible for assembling testimony into the members electronic testimony packets. And our house um, IT staff will be in the conference rooms, so they'll be monitoring the proceedings and running the YouTube, the YouTube, the house YouTube channel. So, and just, you know, importantly, um, for those of you who have not already done so, if you want to um, submit testimony, you need to create an account in order to do that. So if you haven't done that yet, you should just do that right away if possible. Um, you can set it up um, on the capital.hawaii.gov website. And if you have any questions about that, you can call the House Chief Clerk's Office or the House uh, Senate Chief Clerk's Office. Um, and I, I don't have, um, I don't have um, screen sharing. So I'm gonna just show you on the website where, where you have to go to, to create this because you have on our website, there's a section, I don't know if you can see it, or you can't really see it, but there's a link on our website called testimony. So you click on the testimony link and it will take you to uh, another page where you can cre create your account. Okay, I think there was a question about meetings with members. So as the president mentioned, uh, the building will be closed and you know our members are requested to not hold in-person meetings in the Capitol while we are, while we are closed. Uh, for safety protocols, um, as you probably already know, uh, we did adopt a legislative building policy for the Capitol that requires a vaccination card or a negative test result within the past 48 hours. Um, at this time, a booster shot is not required. Uh, as the president mentioned, we will be using private security firms um, when we begin session. So there'll be two uh, security stations. One will be set up in the basement the capital basement, and the second will be set up um, on the rotunda. Um, but you know, because the building is is closed, the 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 role of the security stations really is just, is to just monitor, um, you know, what's happening. Uh, well, when when session begins. But you should also expect that the security stations will continue, even after the building um, reopens. Um, you know, we wanted this president and I felt that we needed to really beef up um, our security system in the building. Uh, and so you will continue to see the security, the private security guards um, at the Capitol. So Bob, that was all that I have. Um, if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Speaker and uh, Senate President. And uh, just to mention a couple of things I had said at the outset, there is a CC button at the bottom of Zoom, and uh, I don't see it either. Uh, that's for closed captioning. And uh, I just uh, sent a message to Jay Fidel at ThinkTech to check on that because it was there when we were testing it, and he will do some checking as to what happened. So uh, there are some other questions, but let me now, um, turn it over to um, Representative Della Albalati and Senator uh, Drew Kanua to uh, talk about anything that they would like to discuss with regard to the schedule, such as uh, bill introduction deadlines, any kind of other limitations, and then we'll go into hearings and testimony. So, let, uh, let's have uh, Senator Kanua and Representative Bellotti, uh on the, on the screen, Eric, thanks. Senator, did you want me to jump in first? I can jump in. Please. So one thing to just stress is actually this uh, session, we're returning to our normal calendar. So if there's any bright spot, 
We're not cutting conference short like we did last year, and there is a little bit of return to post-COVID normality. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you know, we are excited to be going into session. This is going to be a critical year. Lots of things are popping right now, and we're going to be taking up some very serious long-term issues, long-standing issues. Uh, in terms of key deadlines and timelines, you know, in the House, we do have some um, bill introduction limits. Uh, we've been studying uh, the way that uh, the numbers that um, members have been introducing over several years, uh, I, I believe well over a decade. And so we do have bill limits, but even even with those limits, you know, you can get your idea into the hopper. So members are limited to 10 bills um, a year for, for, the, for this part of the uh, biennial. Um, we do have some flexibility for chairs who are allowed to do 15 bill introductions. And there's also a process where waivers uh, and exceptions can be made for any kind of emergency situations. And that goes through leadership and the speaker's office ultimately. Um, there's also our caucuses that have bill um, uh, introduction opportunities. Uh, because this is the biennium and because we were concerned about some of the um, COVID concerns and, and the timeline and the schedule, Caucuses this year are limited to five bills a year. But so, for so many of you who are on this call, and I, I really do appreciate that there's over 500 folks here, um, you know, we have great caucuses that um, work with um, stakeholder groups over the course of the interim. And so many of them are now in the process of going through their prioritizations and getting their bills also uh, set and ready for introduction. And so that's that's the, the main things I wanted to emphasize about bill introduction and, the, the, and that part of the early timetable. I'll throw it back to um, Senator Kanuha. Uh, thanks, uh, Rep. Bilotti. So um, morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Rep. Bilotti stated, uh, you know, the basic legislative timetable is the joint uh, calendar of the Senate and the House. And uh, similar to past years, most of the major deadlines are identical uh, between the two chambers. So you can look on the Capitol uh, website uh, to see the legislative timetable. It should be posted there. Um, any differences that uh, from the House calendar that you want to be made aware of, um, basically decking deadlines as well as bill crossover deadlines in the Senate and the House are identical. Uh, there are lateral deadlines that are included on an internal Senate timetable. So these deadlines are there to ensure that bills move from one Senate committee uh, to another in a timely manner in order to meet major crossover deadlines between the House and the Senate. Uh, the Senate also has additional internal deadlines related to our advice and consent responsibilities. So again, the Senate internal calendar is available on the Senate page of the Capitol website. Um, in terms of bill introduction, you know, traditionally for the Senate, there has been no limit on the number of bills that senators can introduce, um, but the unlimited bill introduction deadline in the Senate is uh, Friday, January 21st. Uh, thereafter, from Monday, January 24th to Wednesday, January 26th, uh, each senator can introduce uh, five bills per day. So um, in terms of uh, what bills are referred to, what committees, you know, I, I think one of the questions was asked whether there will be triple referrals. Uh, sometimes bills have been and can be triple referred depending on the content of the measure. However, you know, the Senate tries to limit uh, referrals whenever possible. So uh, just kind of a little update on how that process goes. Can I jump in, in since I forgot some, to mention a few things? Uh, the House also has a five-day limit uh, beginning January 24th through Je uh, Wednesday, January 26th. So that's a five-day per limit. Uh, in addition, um, there are some other critical key dates um, post introduction of bills, and I would share that you know we do still have our mandatory five day recess um, that will start in, on February 24th and go through uh, March 2nd. And I think what you'll see is a lot of members going out into the community, uh, getting feedback, uh, and that's the whole purpose of the mandatory recess is to get feedback from community members about the legislative process. The other two big key dates. Uh, especially for those folks who are really tracking to make sure their ideas move, which will be even more critical given the new um, ruling that we have uh, from, from the uh, Hawaii Supreme Court. You know, so bills surviving these critical deadlines are going to be even more important. The first critical deadline is um, March 10th, 
first crossover. So that's a big moment when there will be bills that may not make it. And then second crossover on April 14th. And again, all of this, uh, as uh, Senator Kanuha says, is on the website. Uh, triple referrals in the House, uh, we will probably see um, triple referrals. Um, that always happens uh, in the House because we want to make sure that all of the chairs who have responsibility on particular topics have the opportunity to vet those ideas. Um, and, and so uh, that'll be a process that uh, occurs. The, the referral process for the House uh, occurs almost immediately as soon as the bills start to get introduced. Uh, that's something that's done by uh, leadership. And then we, we try to do that very quickly so that members can start to schedule hearings. Thank you, Representative. Just a uh, quick thing. So the Bob, could I just before you uh, get into ahead. the next Sorry, part? President. Yeah, I just wanted to say I don't know. Uh, you know, I know it's been reported in the news, but there was that landslide in Waimea where Representative Morikawa lives, and uh, some residents have been cut off uh, with being able to. Uh, get past the YMS swinging bridge. So I'm involved uh, and got involved since early this morning. We're trying to coordinate a uh, food drive and supplies. So I'm going to be signing off right now and attend to that matter in West Kauai, but I'm leaving you in capable hands with Senators Kanuha and Keith Agaran. Thank you. I see the number has now gotten to over 600 participants. This is just a uh, real amazing uh, job of engagement. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, actually, as of uh, this morning, we had 750 people registered and obviously some people can't make it. And there were questions that already came up uh, as to the replay. This is being recorded and Think Tech is going to put this on YouTube and uh, have two replays as well. So those that have missed it or want to see it again, uh, you can go on YouTube once it's lo loaded up on YouTube uh, to get uh, a more, more detail. Um, okay, let's uh, um, go uh, to the hearings and testimony. And we'll start with the Senate first with uh, Senator Kanua and Senator uh, Keith Agaran about how the Senate is going to conduct its hearings. And I think that uh, Senator Agaron will also talk about uh, how WAM Ways and Means hold their hearings. Um, so we'll begin the session conducting hearings the same way we did in 2021. Uh, senators will have the option to attend hearings in our Senate conference rooms or remotely via Zoom. So for now, since the Capitol building is closed, um, you know, of course, we invite the public to participate remotely via Zoom. All of our hearings are live streamed on the Senate's YouTube channel, and you can view the recorded videos at uh, your convenience. I think it's been really helpful for a lot of uh, people uh, around the state. And even, you know, you see a lot of people, even in the mainland, looking it up on the Senate, Senate's YouTube channel. So uh, we'll continue to accept written testimony. Uh, which can be submitted via the legislature legislature's website and will be posted online. Uh, this was approach. This approach may change later in session, and uh, uh, we look forward to definitely having in-person testimony when the building reopens. Um, in terms of hearings overall, uh, the volume the volume of hearings uh, will be at the discretion of the of each subject matter committee chair. Uh, virtual meeting options have allowed businesses to continue as usual. Um, in terms of uh, what, how the hearings will be scheduled, uh, the subject matter chairs have full discretion on scheduling hearings in their respective committees. To that regard, it is important to communicate early and often uh, with the chair or their clerks uh, to request hearings on bills in their committees. Uh, just like in past years, uh, Senate committees are assigned to specific days and times uh, to hold committee hearings. Um, the schedule will likely be very similar to the last session and the final uh, 2022 hearing schedules will be posted on the legislators, legislature's website. Uh, so for your reference, the 2021 Senate and House Committee hearing schedules can be found on our website's homepage. Um, uh, Senate committees are required to provide public notice of its hearings 
And for the first hearing on a measure, notice is required at least 72 hours uh, before the meeting. 48 hour notice is required for all subsequent meetings. Um, these notice requirements may be waived if good cause is shown. Uh, the, obviously the Senate tries to keep waivers to a minimum. So that's kind of a basic uh, deal. If you wanna <laughs> chime in any, uh, any additional, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is even though it's up to the to committee chairs to decide what bills to hear, um, they are going to have to be very conscious if they're a first committee to uh, get their work done within the time period they're allotted for the hearing. Uh, and so, as you saw in 2021, there's going to be fairly strict time limits on oral testimony, and it, it also may put some limitations on our, our members to get to the point of their question. Um, you know, a lot of people like these talking questions where they're actually um, making a speech rather than asking a question. And I think if they want to be effective this year, I think they're going to have to get right to the point and allow the public to provide their actual input. Um, I, I think uh, for ways and means, as a generally, we're going to be a second committee meaning that um, there will be a substantive hearing on a bill at an earlier hearing. Uh, so most of the work at, at Ways and Means, Consumer Protection, and Judiciary, uh, for the most part, will be decision-making meetings, meaning that uh, we will take written testimony and, um, and then we'll be uh, voting on whether to move bills forward based on that written testimony. If there are going to be substantive amendments to a particular bill, then uh, I think the chairs of Judiciary, Consumer Protection, and Ways and Means will probably hold um, hearings, and then we'll follow the same process as uh, the, the, other, the other committees, meaning that we'll take oral testimony and written testimony, and there'll be uh, some questioning back and forth. Um, I, and I think there was, um, you know, the people might have some concerns about what the impact of the Hawaii Supreme Court's decision is going to be on how we do amendments. And right now, I, I think uh, for the most part, I think we all believe that most of the amendments that are made to bills are germane to the subject matter. And so we don't see that the decision that, they, that the Supreme Court issued will, will, will change what, how we operate. Um, and that, you know, we have short form bills and we have other, um, we were looking at some of our rules and I, I could see us being able to function generally the same as we've functioned in the past. Uh, it, you know, it, it, there may, if there is an emergency, I think the president mentioned the Waimea landslide today. If there is an emergency and we need to deal with something, then, you know, we do have some tools to deal with that as well. And I, and I'm sure that, um, we can reach some agreement with the governor and with the house on extending the session as needed to deal with those types of emergencies. Thank you, Senator. Uh, just uh, a quick comment, you know, I'm glad that Senator Agaron explained the ways and means uh, hearing process because a lot of the hearings are a uh, written testimony only if you're not familiar with that. And there's no oral testimony because the ways and means really does uh, decision making in many of their their hearings. Uh, let, let me repeat that because I see the questions. Uh, we will we are recording this uh, presentation and we will be putting it on YouTube so people can watch it later on and maybe Olelo uh, and Think Tech will replay this uh, periodically uh, throughout January. Um, Senators, any other comment on the hearings or testimony? Yeah, um, I, I did want to mention, I know there was a question earlier. I'll go back to the hearings um, and um, shortly, but uh, in terms of referrals, there was a question about who refers the bills in the Senate. Uh, myself, uh, Senator Keith Ogron and Senator Leslie Hara will be on the referral committee this year. So we're preparing a schedule right now on when to meet, um, obviously when the bills are introduced uh, and get those referrals out as soon as possible. Uh, so to the, that's to answer that question that was brought up earlier. Um, uh, as, as Senator Agaron said uh, previously, you know, we're trying to accommodate as many testifiers as possible. 
uh, to be able to live stream all hearings, including multiple simultaneous meetings. Uh, so the committees have had to adopt uh, a more rigid time schedule. They've had to wrap up their hearings of, on time uh, instead of continuing beyond their scheduled blocks as they may have done in the past. So uh, as a result, uh, many chairs have instituted uh, testimony time limits uh, to ensure their hearings are conducted efficiently and expeditiously as, expeditiously as possible. Um, in terms of, uh, I know there's a question about virtual. I, it was said earlier, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to evolve as much as possible um, with the continuing guidelines that are put out with the city and county of Honolulu and uh, the, the governor. So, you know, it's, it's our intention to continue uh, live streaming all hearings and provide the public with the option to testify remotely even after the building eventually opens. Uh, so Senate leadership uh, will be reevaluating the situation in the coming weeks and we'll definitely post uh, information on the website uh, when the building does reopen. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, maybe, and maybe the only other thing to add is if um, I think I saw a question about whether uh, how would a person determine whether they're still registered to submit testimony? If you're not sure, I think you should go ahead and register again to make sure that you can submit testimony. I think that's the safest thing to do. Thank you, Senator. Okay, let me now turn it over to uh, Representative Della Bellotti and Representative Sylvia Luke to talk about uh, how the House will handle the hearings and the testimony. I'll jump in first and then hand it over to uh, Representative Luke. But there, uh, I'd like to emphasize um, both something that Senator uh, Agaron, Keith Agaron said and uh, Speaker Psyche said. Most importantly, go and set up an account at capital.hawaii.gov. Uh, and if you've done it before but haven't used your account in a long time, do it now again and just refresh um, your familiarity with the site. Because once you do that, there's a wealth of information, uh, information and instructions about how to um, participate and provide testimony online and sign up for remote testimony. I did want to mention that once you create an account, you're going to see that there's this 24 hour deadline that's talked about in um, submitting testimony. And what I'd like to, I think, um, Senator Kanu, you may want to come back on later on. I don't know how hard of a deadline that is for the Senate, but on the House side, uh, we really have had to beef up our tech of staff. And so this allows and enables um, uh, them to prepare sometimes what can be very voluminous testimony. So we encourage folks, especially on the House side, to submit testimony 24 hours in advance of the hearing date. Now that deadline is not a hard and fast deadline. If you miss it, you can still submit testimony afterwards. And in both the House and the Senate, the submission of written testimony will then get you the invitation, the Zoom link, to be able to participate in the remote portion on the day of the hearing. So even in the House side, if you miss that 24 hour deadline, uh, you will still be able to have your uh, testimony um, accepted and processed. It may be identified as late versus on time. And then all of that testimony after the hearing will be posted. Uh, I believe in the House, what happens is the testimony that has been processed uh, prior to that 24 hour deadline will be posted at the start of the hearing. Uh, and so again, really si sign up early and um, you know, recognize that if you miss that deadline, at least in the House, you can still, you still have time to be able to submit testimony and still get that link and still participate up to the very minute of, uh, of, of the actual start of the hearing. But we don't want to put you in that position because what sometimes happens is once the hearing starts, we encourage folks to um, log in early so that if there's any assistance that needs to happen, uh, any instructions from our IT staff to um, uh, participants, um, they, they can do that in the waiting room. And so we really encourage folks to participate virtually as the Senate does as well. That's the main part, part that I wanted to highlight with the difference of, of hearing and testimonies generally. The chairs do get to determine um, scheduling of, of, of bills in, on our side as well. Um, I'll turn it over now to uh, Representative Luke.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today um, for finance um, and other afternoon committees in the House. Um, as you know, we allow oral testimony uh, in addition to written testimony. Um, so in the past, it was not unusual for a finance committee to start uh, sometimes in the afternoon at 2 p.m. and go till midnight. So. Um, at every start of the hearing, we ask for your indulgence and your patience. And also, you know, my request to everyone is because all the members have written testimony ahead of time, um, the expectation on the members is that they come to the hearings prepared and um, have read the testimony. So in as much as you um, not read your testimony word for word, I know, um, you know, people believe that, hey, you know, if they read word for word, we will um, it will have better impact, but a lot of times um, as it gets long and then, you know, we're closing in at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., you know, you lose a little bit of attention span for legislators as well who's been um, there since 2 p.m. So I ask for your indulgence in summarizing your testimony um, um, there is no limit. We try not to limit the amount of time. I know for morning committees, um, they try to tell uh, testifiers to keep it at one minute or two minutes only because they're limited by um, session. So if they start at eight, nine o'clock, they have to finish by 1130. So there might be a limitation on time. Um, uh, I try not to limit um, only because um, you don't want time limitation to take away from your message, but at the same time, if you can summarize, it will have uh, much more, um, we would have so much greater appreciation uh, and then it will have a lot of impact um, as well. Um, I would say that um, uh, we, the, the finance committee, um, uh, similar to WAM, we hear on a year, I would say um, somewhere between, uh, 600 to um, 900 bills. And that's a huge volume of bills just in maybe like two weeks time because, you know, we're known as the back end committee and we, um, we have to deal with a lot of volume. I get questions about whether or testifiers would try to make substantive changes in finance committee. And I try to discourage that only because um, we want to empower the subject matter chairs and the subject matter committees to take, um, take uh, you know, consideration and make changes in the subject matter. So we try not to make substantive changes because we feel that that's the jurisdiction of the subject matter. So a lot of times, you know, we try to get as many bills out of our committee, um, but it, it's going to be passed as is because we um, respect the jurisdictional lines. Um, we will hear uh, and consider carryover bills. Um, this is the second year of the biennium. So all bills introduced and um, um, introduced last year um, that have not gotten hearings in certain um, committees only because of the time constraints or um, time constraints or, you know, because of uh, uh, couldn't reach an agreement or cert there were cer certain problems, those are still alive. And as opposed to starting over, if there's a, uh, I think you should talk to um, the committee chairs who uh, you were working with or, um, you know, legislators that you were working with and see if those bills can be reconsidered. And even if it's in conference committee, we have the ability to revive um, bills in conference committee. So you don't have to start all over. And that's one of the ways that you can help us through this um, process as well. Uh, uh, Rep. Luke or Rep. Bellotti, um, one question that came up is, are we able to send more than one piece of testimony per account, or is it still limited to only one testimony per account? That is a stumper uh, for us. I am actually putting a, a sending a text right now to our IT folks. I know that that was the situation last session, so I don't know if we have a fix for that yet. Uh, Senator Kanuha, any insights on that one? I don't have an update on that one, uh, but we can definitely look it up. 
Thank you. Um, Representative Luke, one of the questions that uh, I have is that when a committee member has a question of a testifier who's testifying obviously virtually, do you allow the question to be asked while the person is, at the time the person finished uh, his or her testimony, or do you go to the next person and then call that person back at the end of the uh, testimony on that particular bill? So the way that we usually um, run our um, hearings is that we take all the testimony for one particular bill and then we um, allow members to ask questions after all the testimony for that specific bill is um, finished, only because there might be duplicative testimonies or there might be um, counter arguments and you want the members to hear everything before uh, the member asks. Thank you, Rep. Luke. Rep. Pilati, uh, with regard to the substantive committees, not finance, um, do they follow the same process that they usually wait until the testimony on that particular bill is done and then ask questions and the testifier should wait in uh, the hold or the waiting room to be called back? Yes, that's a similar process. Um, in terms of the waiting room, you know, because the committees are of different sizes and are dealing with different volumes, they may be pulled out of the waiting room uh, earlier and be, be so so uh, again that could be a uh, um, different from committee to committee uh, because again of the size and the volume uh, and that's why people should sign in early to be able to get the instructions from the IT staff. Thank you, uh, Senator Kanua and Senator uh, Agaron. Do you does the Senate follow the same kind of process that they wait until the testimony is done? on a particular bill, and then a, a committee member can ask the question? I think that really depends on the chair, because we give them complete discretion how they run their meetings. So especially when it's a bill that has a voluminous amount of testimony, sometimes it makes more sense to ask the questions as, as the testimony is given. And I, I think it's, we sort of leave that to the discretion of the chairs. I think we we uh, expect that they will, they know how to run their committees and they know how to um, run the most, run it the most effective way. Any comments in a canoe for the substantive committees? Probably the same way. The, the same as uh, uh, Senator Agaron, Keith Agaron uh, described. Okay, let me check on, hang on one second while, uh, but Bob, maybe maybe I'll just bring up one thing. Um, you know, obviously, again, you know, to emphasize to create an account um, is is it's you know to submit testimony. It's it's easy. It's fast. Um, uh, if but if you do need any assistance, definitely uh, you can contact the legislature's public access room. You know, the the office was created to assist the public in learning about and participating in the legislative process. Uh, their website includes helpful guides and videos and the staff is uh, super knowledgeable. So definitely contact the Hawaii Public Access Room. You can look it up on the um, on Google. Um, I, I think the, the email is par at capital.hawaii.gov um, or you can call them. I had that number somewhere, 808-587. Uh, 0478 and they can help you with any needs uh, uh, any questions you have. Thank you Senator. There was a question uh, while we are in the waiting room can we also see and hear the full hearing and I believe you can just because you're in the waiting room uh, that doesn't mean that you are you know not you're, you're totally off the uh, screen. How would you be able to give how would you be able to give oral testimony only if the only way you can get the link to participate is by submitting written testimony? Uh, I, I think that 
when we used to have uh, live hearings, uh, the chair would always at the end of the hearing after people that have sent in written testimony, they would ask, does anybody else uh, want to testify? I don't think that is the process anymore. So unless you send in written testimony, um, you are not able to testify. Is that correct, uh, representatives and senators? Rep. Bilotti, I, you, you know, the question is that if the person has not sent in written testimony, I can't remember any chair saying, is there anybody else that wants to testify that may be on the Zoom uh, watching it, but has never sent in any written testimony? Uh, so it's, it, yes, I think uh, chairs will recognize folks. The, the thing is, is if you are in the Zoom room, you will have, have to submit some kind of testimony to get that Zoom link. So right. what oftentimes we will see is uh, testimony I support, and that's it. And so then pers a person wants to amplify uh, and add to their testimony, which they might obviously want to do. That's when in the um, remote proceeding, they're able to then chime in. So it's, it's a little bit of a, it is still a requirement to submit uh, something in order to get the Zoom link. Th th thank you, Representative. That, that's a tip from Representative Bellotti. You know, a lot of times you get the notice or you're watching and the, you really realize that a bill that you're interested in, uh, you just saw the notice and you don't have time to really submit the testimony. But if you send in anything, you know, I support or I oppose, then you're going to get the Zoom link so that you can go on the um, hearing and like Rep. Bellotti said, expand on it. Uh, one question, what is the process to submit revised testimony? From last session, the submittal system accept only one testimony per account. I think that was the earlier question as well. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what the, um, how you submit revised testimony. I can try to tackle that. Um, so, even if we weren't in a virtual system, revised testimony isn't really something that's taken. Uh, even when we are in normal times, right? If, if you revise your testimony, there's no process to do that. So essentially what comes in by the time of the start of the hearing is what comes in. And the way our process works is if you have changed testimony and, you're, and the bill keeps moving, that's when you can at the next hearing submit um, additional testimony to help uh, enlightened legislators. Um, can, can I make a quick clarification, Bob, because I, I, um, I just got a text message from our, again, our high, handy staff, IT staff people. Um, for the House hearings, uh, we don't hold people in the waiting rooms while the entire um, hearing is going on. So as soon as the hearing opens, we let anyone who's in the waiting room into the room so that they can then hear the testimony. I don't believe that if you're sitting in the waiting room, you can actually hear what's going on. You would have to have an additional TV or an additional uh, computer where you could watch it on, from the YouTube um, uh, channels or from um, Alelo. And so um, really, again, important to come early to hearing so that you can get into the hearing, at least on the House side. And then there was another question that I wanted to address about, is there a time limit or is there a limit of uh, testifiers? Uh, no. Uh, there, there is no limit placed on testifiers. The chairs have been really good in the first time that we went um, all virtual at getting to all of the um, testifiers. I didn't encounter anything where people were cut off. Um, there are going to be situations, however, when uh, there are going to be a lot, a lot of testifiers. And at that point in time, um, chairs, again, have that discretion to run their meetings um, in, in the way that they see fit so that they can get through all of the testifiers. I think that's, that's most of my clarifications at this point, Bob. Turning it over back to you. Thank you. Uh, there was a question, um, let's see, just, I just lost it. Who refers bills in the House? And uh, thank you to Senator Kanu for answering that. So either Rep. Bilotti or Rep. Luke, you know, who uh, are the House members that refer the bills? 
Sure, I'll take that. Um, I, I say house leadership and I apologize for using kind of our internal acronyms. Uh, that is for the house, it's speaker, uh, vice speaker, myself and uh, majority floor leader, uh, representative D. Morikawa from Kauai. Thank you. There was a uh, statement by a house uh, legislator to just wanting to clarify if advocates are online and have the Zoom link, they will not be denied the opportunity to testify. I guess, you know, whether there was a glitch or something happened, this happened in one committee meeting last year. And she just wanted to clarify that uh, if you uh, have the Zoom link, you will not be denied. Uh, Bob, just real quick. Um, I, I, I know I don't want to go all the way back, but, you know, another reason why uh, written testimony, we have that requirement, you know, we want to make sure that the committee can still consider someone's input, you know, if there are technical problems during a testifier's turn to speak. Uh, so that's another uh, important reason why uh, it's, you, uh, it's good to submit, uh, or it's the requirement to submit uh, written testimony, you know, as was the case before the pandemic, uh, the Senate asked for written testimony to, sub be, to be submitted at least 24 hours before the hearing. Uh, anything submitted inside of the 24 hour cutoff will still be added to the record, uh, but may not be posted online or distributed to the members of the committee before the hearing begins. Uh, thank you, Senator. I think that kind of uh, addresses one of the questions that if they wanted to submit revised testimony, whether it has to be within 24 hours, because the original testimony comes in 24 hours ahead of time, and they get the Zoom link. And so like 12 hours later, they put in revised testimony that may not uh, show up to the uh, committee members, but it, it may uh, end up on the record of some sort. Uh, this is a real uh, technical, well, let's see, where did it go? Sorry, hang on one second. Um, oh, this was, you know, somebody just uh, asked a question, would any of the legislature, legislators be in favor of increasing testimony time for uh, Kupuna? Uh, and um, anyway, that, that's the basic question. Well, well generally, I, again, let me point out that the chairs have complete control over their committee hearings. If even, if, even with the, whatever it is, the one minute or three minute limit that different chairs use, if they feel like they need to provide more time, they, they certainly have discretion to do that on the Senate side. And I think on the House side, there is no limit, is what I heard the uh, majority leader say. I'll clarify that. Our chairs also have discretion. Some chairs do use um, two-minute deadline uh, time, times. And really, it's a mechanism that they, they often use because they have so many bills and so many testifiers lined up. But again, the chairs have the discretion, and you'll often see them use that. Uh, especially because they have in front of them, you know, what their agenda is like. If it if it's just three bills, you know, for the earlier committees, um, but but really, it's it's the chair's discretion. Okay. And then again, so um, for a finance committee, we don't put a limit on the time. Um, I think the um, the the one thing to note is um, when things are remote, um, testifiers and um, the testifiers don't know how many people are actually waiting in the room. Uh, when um, Capitol was open, you can see, you know, sometimes hundreds of people waiting to testify. And I think that puts some pressure on the testifier to uh, give quick testimony. But when you don't see anybody, um, you know, um, I think there's a tendency to uh, um, take a while, right? Um, so Usually myself or other chairs will remind people, hey, you know, uh, we have about 100 people more um, testifying, so if you can summarize. Um, and for the most part, you know, the public um, and the testifiers have been really great about that. Um, so, you know, we continue to thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, Rep. Luke. Um, there was one other question here. Last year, 
I recall you had to check a box to opt in for oral testimony when you were submitting written testimony. So it's not that you get the link just because you submitted written testimony. Is that the same this year? I can't remember that particular thing, uh, reps and senators. I can't. Hmm. Can you restate the question, no. Bob? I'm sorry. Well, I, I think, Bob, the questioner is correct. Uh, on the agenda, the posted agenda, yeah. you, when you submit written testimony, you also have an opportunity to say you want to submit oral. And if you, if, you, if you hit, if you check that off, then you will get the link um, so that you can get into the waiting room and we'll be able to, we'll, you'll be able to be called on. One question that came up, are the is the legislature considering making a public computer available where people can come in to a limited space in the Capitol or somewhere else and participating using Zoom on that computer? There, I, yeah. there won't be anything at the Capitol like how they used to have at public access room, but I do want to encourage folks. Um, I, I, my understanding is, is that the public library uh, or public libraries across the state do have access. And so I would check with your uh, local library and Stacey Aldrich has been wonderful uh, at making the libraries really hubs for, for connectivity in places that are really remote. And so I would look there as an option. Although I, I think as the chair, as the uh, Senate president and the speaker said, you know, I think we all are uh, approaching this as we're going to be very flexible as we continue on. If the circumstances of the pandemic change and the rules that the city and county have change, then, you know, we are going to be looking at all avenues to make sure that the public can get access to the legislature. And if that means if we can set up something like that, then we will look at that. Um, at the appropriate time. But right now, I think uh, as the majority leader mentions, I think libraries are a, are a big resource for this. If uh, any of the attendees uh, watching this seminar have any other questions on hearings and testimony, uh, please uh, send them into the Q&A box and uh, we will take a look at that uh, as soon as possible. But in the meantime, uh, let, let me turn this over to um, Representative Luke and Senator Gil Agaron to talk about some of the budget issues and financial issues, as well as, and I know there were some questions that came up, to talk about the grant in aid that is going to be implemented uh, this session. So I'll Rep. Luke and Senator Agaron, if you can talk about the GIA process, I guess Rep. Luke and I talked about it. And there is a uh, something on the website that you can look at with details on how to apply and the requirements. Rep. I'll Luke? turn it over to um, Senator um, Keith Algaron to discuss GIAs. Okay. Sure, right. thanks. Uh, and thank you to you and to Chair De La Cruz for advocating to have GIAs this year. And I think that um, I know that a lot of the nonprofits have not had the opportunity to apply for state grant and aids for the last two years. Uh, we will be offering this year uh, $10 million in operating GIAs and $20 million in CIP GIAs. The process is the same as it has been in the past. There's a deadline to get your application in. The application uh, form is on the legislative website. The difference is that this year, uh, we're not requiring you to submit the application by the deadline in hard copy. Um, we're gonna allow you to submit it by email. And I, I think uh, that's something that both the House Finance and Senate Ways and Means have agreed on. Do you have anything else to add on that? Correct. Uh, and the deadline is December, oh, sorry, January 21. <laughs> so it's usually the Friday. I know we're getting all our months and days all uh, mixed up. You know, 2022 came so fast. So um, 
deadline is Friday, January 21st. Um, the only thing is that um, for mail, um, uh, it's not postmarked. We need to have it in hand by the 21st. So that might be a little bit tricky because you have to anticipate how long um, uh, the postal service will take. So I encourage you to, if it's completed, submit it as early as you can because we're already scanning the documents. Um, uh, thanks to uh, Senator Agaran and Senator uh, Dela Cruz, they'll be overseeing the GIA for the House side. It's um, Representative Nishimoto who will be overseeing the GIA process or GIA application um, on, the, the, on the House's behalf. Rep. Luke and Senator Agaran, in prior years, when the Capitol was open, there would be a, um, a chance for all those who submitted a grant in aid to come to the Capitol in the auditorium and make a two-minute speech as to why they would get it. How are you going to handle that this year? Is there going to be a virtual uh, session where people can spend a couple minutes to say why they uh, deserve the GIA or expand on the application? Yes, that's something, uh, the timing of that, uh, we will still need to discuss with, um, uh, you know, between myself and um, Chair De La Cruz, but we are hoping that we can do a virtual one. The, um, the, the, information provided by the applicants. Um, we have found them very useful and it allowed for the committee members and um, um, the legislators in charge of vetting it, um, an opportunity to um, ask questions as opposed to, you know, it's basically um, in the past, it was about over 270 applications. So clearly, um, our legislators cannot take 270 meetings in a, such a short amount of time. Um, so that process has helped us vet through a lot of the applications. So we're working um, towards that. Um, once the date is set, uh, we will let all the applicants know. Thank you. Any other thing, uh, Rep. Luke or uh, Senator Agaran, uh, on any financial issues that the, oh, uh, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. Audience should be uh, oh, um, aware of. Um, so, as you know, uh, the legislature received the governor's budget, and I know a lot of people are talking about the, um, the one thing that stuck out um, to everybody uh, was the administration's proposal to put a billion dollars into the rainy day fund. Uh, I think uh, many legislators are having. Um, some um, uh, issues with that, or you know, they they will want to take a look at it closer. Um, uh, in 2020, the Senate and the House had a joint package um, because that was in a time where the economy was um, strong and we were um, looking at further expansion and growth in our. Um, state's economy. So in 2020, we had a package of bills that it was a joint package by the Senate and the House, and the governor also agreed. And it was the first time where um, Senate, House, and the governor agreed to four set of bills. One of the um, bills was um, dealing with tax equity, and that bill would have um, allowed for uh, EITC um, expansion, um, funding for credits. And I think that is something that um, both the Senate and the House are interested in revisiting. Um, as both, the last two years were very difficult for a lot of people. And as we continue to work towards economic recovery, I think it is important for us to take care of our um, low-income families and our working families. And I think the best way to do it is um, through tax credits and tax incentives. Yeah, I think the finance chair raises a good point that, you know, we did have that joint package and there were a number of things that we were still able to pursue on the housing side, but on, the, on some of the human service and childcare and health issues, uh, those are things that now I think we are gonna take a close look at and look at revisiting. 
I mean, I, I think it's also going to be an opportunity to take a look at how the homeless um, programs are doing and um, other health and human services issues. Um, I know that one of the things that we want to make sure, though, is that if there's an opportunity to make um, investments in the economy and, and moving really, really moving for the first time towards real diversification, I think that's something that, at least on the Senate side, that that's something that I know our chairs have um, expressed a lot of interest in. And I know that Chair De La Cruz has made that a key part of how he wants to work on bills in, that come to the Ways and Means Committee is, and do you have a plan and how is this going to help with um, employment? How is it going to help with diversifying our economy? How is it going to help in just making life better for the people of Hawaii? So, yeah, certainly we're going to, um, I, I'm, we're looking forward to uh, an expansion of the EITC to make it refundable. Um, we already have it, but it's not refundable. And also, I think uh, this is something that we can agree with the House that, you know, maybe it's time to really look at the minimum wage um, and look at hiking. It. And I know that uh, I think the speaker has already, you know, put out a figure. And I don't know if we're going to get into a bidding war, but I'm, I'm sure that's something that's going to come up um, um, over the next set, part of the session. And in last session, um, even if we were looking at a budget deficit, <clears throat> thanks to the um, assistance from the federal government, we were pleased that at the end, we were able to restore many of the um, social services program because when we received the governor's budget, um, um, the governor's budget, um, reduce or substantially impacted uh, sex assault services, HIV, um, and um, other uh, critical services. And at the end, we were able to restore many of those things. Um, but um, domestic violence services continue to be an issue as people are forced to stay home. And, um, and many of these um, uh, issues become exponentially um, difficult um, when you're in a situation where you have high stress and anxiety. So I think we will continue to be looking at um, supporting social services, social service um, uh, programs and, and looking at Medicaid um, issues, because as you know, um, you know, for the Medicaid, providers out there, um, it, you know, they have a hard time um, keeping their offices open or providing the services because the Medicaid reimbursement is very low. And if we can equalize some of those um, areas and provide additional help for um, Medicaid reimbursement, I think th this is an opportunity for us to do that as well. And I think in, in, in conjunction with that, obviously, we want to focus a little bit more on mental health. Um, I know that um, mental health services have had a lot of cuts, um, especially um, mental health in our schools, because I know that the going to virtual learning was not the most beneficial for a lot of people in, in our school system. And I think mental health is going to be one of the focuses that uh, the department that our, that our health committee as well as our human services committee is going to be looking at this year. You know, there was a uh, question, but it's really more like a suggestion, uh, whether there will be banners on the Zoom hearing screen to show what bill is being testified on. And uh, they're suggesting that that would make it less confusing. And I just wanted to, to make sure that uh, you heard that that suggestion. The other tip that came up uh, was that uh, the computers at the library are time limited and uh, library limits usage of their PC to 50 minutes. Uh, but you can bring your own laptop in and use their Wi Fi and participate by um, headphones. Uh, and the library computers are only available to people uh, who have been vaccinated. So as we um, go into the last 15 minutes, I'll check the Q&A as, as we um, discuss some other things, but 
One of the issues that uh, uh, came up last year, because we only had a, ye uh, a year, a week uh, for conference, and this year at least there will be two weeks. But if things loosen up with regard to COVID, is there a possibility that you would have some of, uh, is there a possibility that there could be uh, some individuals allowed into the conference uh, committee process. What what some of us found difficult last year was, you know, when uh, you are mo monitoring a bill, and in prior years you're there, so you can give input uh, right after the conference to the committee chair and members. And this year, uh, or in 2021, was very difficult because then you have to call uh, and, you know, people, legislators are busy, not always available, but would that be a consideration, I guess, for conference or is it going to be basically run the same way if the Capitol is shut down throughout the whole session? So I'm going to address that question by saying we're actually hoping, or I personally am hoping that we can revise our policies uh, if the Omicron surge subsides. So we're not going to wait until conference to make that determination. Uh, as Senate President said earlier, we're going to, th this is subject to change. And so we have become very adaptable. I will literally say that two weeks before the um, holidays, we were on calls preparing to come back in person. And so we literally had to pivot in the last two days. Uh, we're going to be prepared to open up and in the event that we can open up, um, it will be the public who will be able to come, not just select groups of people uh, for conference purposes. It will be open to the public in a way that's fair and transparent and, and the public will be allowed to come in. Now, will there be requirements of going through checkpoints? Um, yes, there, you know, we, that has become part of our new normal. That frankly, if to get into certain places, you're going to have to meet certain requirements. And so those will be rolled out at the appropriate time when we can reopen. Um, Bob, I think you we, we heard loud and clear, right? In person is better in the communications process. And so that's what we're working towards. I'll throw it to uh, Senator Kanuha to add anything. Thanks, Rep. Bilotti. Any other comments on the uh, uh conference committee process? Yeah, I mean, Bob, you know, obviously uh, not to uh, say the same thing that Rep. Bilotti said, but it, it's certainly our hope uh, that we'll be able to open the building sooner rather than later and allow some type, some level of public in-person attendance by the time we get to a uh, conference period. But, you know, it's it's it'll depend on the situation and the pandemic-related guidance in effect uh, later this year. Um, you know, I, I'd suggest not waiting until the conference period to provide your input. If the bill is something important to you, submit testimony at the hearings uh, held by the standing committees and, and start to reach out to the appropriate chairs. Uh, of course, maybe your, your district senator and uh, representative earlier in the session, um, it, it becomes very busy during the conference time period and it will probably be more difficult to schedule a meeting or phone call during the period. So. <laughs> The so sooner rather than later, but I know uh, bills change during the time. So obviously we're, we're always open to uh, input during conference period, during the conference period time, but sooner rather than later. Thank you, Senator. One comment that just came in uh, that this person feels that the, well, not only this person, but the homeless problem is heartbreaking. And uh, um, she's uh, asking, the legislature to please focus on this issue. I just wanted to mention that. Bob, um, I know I know there's a lot of suggestions in the in the chat box. Um, if you could maybe, I know you're bringing it up now, but send it to us if you somehow download it and send it to us at a you know after this meeting is finished. Uh, can you please do that? Yes, uh, Think Tech uh, uh, can uh, bring it all up. Uh, we did it last year some of the questions and other things in the chat, and uh, I'll send it to all of you. Thank you. So as we um, finish up here, uh, I'd like to give all of you a chance to make some what I consider closing comments. Um, 
And I don't know, I see, I don't know if Speaker Psyche is still uh, on uh, or not. I know that Senate President had to take care of that situation on Kauai, but um, I can start uh, with um, Senator Kanuha for any uh, closing comments and then Senator Gil Agaran, Representative uh, Bilotti, and then Representative Luke. Sure, and you know, as was stated that by Senate President earlier, it's pretty amazing to be on a panel with 500, 600 plus people uh, tuning in. So uh, thank you all for uh, participating. And uh, again, Mahalo Bob and Jay uh, for creating this space uh, to share about the 2022 legislative session. Um, if you have any questions or require assistance during session, please do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us or our staff. Again, public access room, a lot of great information. Uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us, but it's uh, definitely great to do this uh, with such passionate and experienced individuals. So, uh, you know, mahalo for uh, everything and uh, and I'll just turn it over. Well, thank you, Senator Kanua. Senator Keith Algaran. Yeah, I also wanted to thank um, you and Jay for and the staff at PLI and um, Think Tech Hawaii for putting this on. I think this is, given the interest, um, given the number of people that are on this on this Zoom, tells me that there's a, still a lot of interest in what's happening in the legislature. And uh, we, I appreciate that the that people can be patient as we and flexible as we work through this. Because as I, again, let me emphasize that there could be changes. There could be changes coming forward, um, depending on the situation of the COVID, um, the COVID situation, as we go along, and hopefully we'll be moving towards more um, public access, in-person access. Um, and I think all of us um, believe that that's something that we should be aiming for. Um, finally, I, I think uh, there's a lot of information on the website on how you can participate and and I think that's probably one of the best places to go and take a look and we'll be looking at all of the questions that came in through the chat and um, if there's a way to get responses um, uh, we'll maybe we'll be looking at putting that up on the website too it's just just as a follow-up to what we did today so again thank you for tuning in thank you senator uh, representative Bellotti Thank you. Uh, I got three buckets of points to make. First, I want to an answer some questions that we left out. Someone asked, if you want to just listen, uh, do you still have to submit testimony online to and be and get the Zoom link? I really urge folks who are just wanting to listen, there are the options to watch our hearings on uh, the Senate and um, House YouTube channels. This will really help with our um, IT staff and our broadband connectivity. Uh, unless you really want to um, provide testimony, there are other options to just watch and listen. Um, a second question that went unanswered is right before the hearing, will you get a Zoom link? Uh, I want to leave you with this takeaway. The House policy is to really encourage engagement and participation in the hearing process. I cannot say that if you uh, log in, two minutes before a hearing that everything will work smoothly and you will get a Zoom link and you'll be able to testify. We really wanna encourage folks to do things early. And so yes, while you may um, uh, you know, sign in and get a link, um, you will. Our staffers are trying to do that because our house policy is very liberal to encourage participation, but we really urge people to um, do things early. Finally, there was a question in the chat about Ken, um, because there are no appointments uh, uh, being scheduled or public um, meetings right now at the uh, Capitol, can members still meet um, outside of the Capitol? Yes, they can. So really, you know, you need to call the offices or the people you want to make appointments with and you can do that. Um, finally, um, my last kind of comment to this, I, I also want to extend my thanks to Bob and Jay. You guys have really proven the value of the Zoom. Uh, we will be taking back some of these comments. I, in particular, love the um, suggestion about banners and tickers. We will take these um, suggestions back right away. We don't know if we'll be able to implement all of these, um, but we will try our, our hardest. Um, I think, you know, we're all learning how to be more effective virtually and remotely. So thank you. 
Bob and Jay for providing this opportunity for us to, to get better at what we're doing. Thank you, Rep. Pilati. Representative Luke. Thank you, uh, Mahalo Bob and everyone for um, tuning in today. Um, you know, your participation and your input will help us um, navigate through this difficult time. I think um, the lessons that we learned during the pandemic, you know, we won't forget. And one of the um, one of the uh, bright spot was this opportunity to do virtual hearings. So I think even if we open up, we will never get back to just completely in person because we saw the value of providing opportunities to the neighbor islands or opportunities to maybe local residents who might be abroad at that point to just um, sign in and participate. And I think, um, you know, that's something that we need to be better at. And in the future, we would like uh, um, to provide public spaces around the state where people could go and um, you know participate. Whether it's not just for the capital, for but for land board or other type of boards. And um, as we uh, figure out how to provide broadband access to the most remote areas in the state, I think we have to do better in providing that accessibility to be available to everybody. So this has been really helpful and thank you very much. And a um, lot of times, you know, um, during the session, I know it's um, high stress and high anxiety. And, um, you know, sometimes we don't know what's, uh, you don't, may not know what's going on. And believe me, a lot of times, you know, we don't really know what's going on either because things are moving so quickly. Uh, I would encourage you to make a lot of appointments, talk to legislators and find out what's going on. And I look forward to seeing you in person soon. And, um, and that's kind of the missing part in the last two years. We really miss having people at the Capitol. So we look forward to the day when it's open again. Thank you very much, Representative Luke. Uh, my final comments, you know, I'd like to thank uh, all of the legislators, Senate President Ronald Kuchi and House Speaker Scott Psyche, and the four legislators that are still on the panel, you know, Senator Kanuha and Senator Keith Agaron, and Representative Bellotti and Representative Luke. I really appreciate the time you took out to uh, get prepared for this and uh, to spend the time this morning to educate the public and those interested in, in the process. So thank you very much. And thank you all of those who attended this seminar. I really appreciate your interest and uh, your comments. I think will be very helpful, not only to me as Pacific for Pacific Law Institute to do future uh, public service seminars, but also to the legislators. And lastly, uh, Think Tech will provide a quick uh, evaluation survey, which I would hope that you would take a, a less than 30 seconds to fill out. And uh, we can uh, say that the uh, seminar is uh, uh, finished and thank you again. And legislators, thank you for spending the time. Appreciate it.